acting. <laughs> Star Trek vs. Star Wars, the eternal debate between the sci-fi fans. Let's look at the history of these two companies. I'll do a bit more focus on the movies, but ignoring the TV series outright would be a massive disservice to Star Trek. Star Trek stinks! Yeah, live long and suck it! Gene Roddenberry created Star Trek in 1964 with the idea that every episode of the series would work as a morality tale, reflecting contemporary issues disguised as sci-fi adventures. Since he was concerned he couldn't sell Star Trek with a premise like that, he chose to publicly just refer to it as a western in space. The show would be set 300 years in the future and would be about, well... Space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. Its five-year mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no man has gone before. The series aired on NBC from 1966 to 1969 and was canceled due to production issues. It is believed that the show was canceled due to low ratings, which is actually a myth. The show maintained reasonably strong ratings and was canceled due to one of the hundred other reasons a show could be canceled. The show did prove popular enough to get revived for one year in a critically acclaimed animated series that ran from 1973 to 74. Gene Roddenberry began putting together a new Star Trek series called Star Trek Phase 2. Sadly, the work on that series ended when Paramount Television Service closed down. It appeared as though Star Trek was done. After completing American Graffiti, George Lucas began work on Star Wars in 1973. He based a lot of the story on the 1936 Flash Gordon serials. 20th Century Fox picked up the film. Lucas founded Industrial Light and Magic to create the special effects specifically for this movie. The story would be a traditional hero's journey where Luke Skywalker gets a call to go against the evil Empire and the menacing Darth Vader. Released in 1977, Star Wars was a huge critical and financial success, earning $775 million worldwide wide, and becoming the highest grossing film of all time until it was dethroned by E.T. in 1983. With the success of Star Wars, Paramount and Gene Roddenberry took the pilot for Star Trek Phase 2 and turned it into Star Trek The Motion Picture. The film was bogged down with production issues that Paramount blamed on Roddenberry. It featured the original crew going on a mission to save the Earth. It was highly criticized for being too slow moving. Still, it brought in more than enough money to compensate for the budget and to show that fan interest in the Star Trek brand was still extremely high. The Empire Empire Strikes Back, the sequel to Star Wars, was released in 1980. This time, George Lucas took a backseat, only working on the story, hiring Lee Brackett to work on the screenplay and Irving Kirshner to direct. After Lee Brackett's untimely death, Lawrence Kasdan was brought on to finish the script. Kirshner was an interesting choice to direct since his previous work was focused more on characters and less on grand scale stories. The movie wasn't as big a hit as the original, which really didn't mean much since it still made a huge amount of money. Many consider this the best Star Wars movie to date. In 1982, Star Trek was back with Star Trek The Wrath of Khan. Like Star Wars, the sequel had a different director. Unlike Star Wars, it was not by choice. Paramount forced Gene Roddenberry out in favor of Harv Bennett, whose previous work was mostly in television. When asked if he could produce a Star Trek movie for less than 40 fucking five million dollars, Bennett replied he could make five movies for that price. Nicholas Meyer was brought on to direct, and the film proved to be a success, bringing in nearly as much as the first movie, while only costing a third as much. Unlike the first film, this one was met with solid reviews. A year later, the third and final 
before our time, Star Wars movie was released. It was originally titled Revenge of the Jedi, but then was changed to Return of the Jedi because Lucas felt revenge was not a Jedi concept. The movie was filmed under the title of Blue Harvest to hide the film's production. Lucas had a bit more of a hand in this movie, co-writing the script with Lawrence Kasdan. The movie was directed by Richard Markhand. Lucas hired Markhand after seeing his film Eye of the Needle. His career was cut short when he died of a stroke in 1987. Due to Markhand's inexperience with special effects, Lucas Lucas frequently worked with him on set. This was, again, less successful than its predecessor, but was still a long ways from being a flop. Though the reviews weren't as positive for this one as they were for the previous two, they were still very good. In 1984 and 1986, Star Trek released two more sequels. Larry Nimoy had planned to quit the series, but was lured back with the offer of taking the director's chair for both Star Trek III, The Search for Spock, and Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home. While Star Trek III didn't do as well as its predecessors, it still came close, and Star Trek IV proved to be the most successful film in the franchise yet. Star Trek returned to the small screen in 1987 with Star Trek The Next Generation. The spin-off was set about 100 years later than the original series and featured a new crew. Space. The final frontier. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. Its continuing mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no one has gone before. It lasted for seven years, far surpassing the original series' run, and did something most would consider impossible. The original series had made the characters of Kirk and Spock common household names. The next generation did the same for the characters of Picard and Data. The big screen journeys of the original crew didn't end. In 1989, Star Trek V The Final Frontier was released, this time helmed by William Shatner. The film was loosely based on one of Gene Roddenberry's old ideas for the first Star Trek film. The crew goes on a search for God, which could have been an interesting premise, but production issues and a Kirk-heavy script at the sacrifice of almost every other character made this the least successful Star Trek film on all levels. Many of the actors wanted to leave the series at this point, but after the poor reception of Star Trek V, they were all tempted to return for 1991 Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country in order to give the series a proper outro. Nicholas Meyer returned to direct this final film to feature the original cast. Gene Roddenberry saw an edit of the film before his passing and reportedly showed disapproval with what he saw. The film played as a mystery with a heavy political backdrop that was mirrored by the real-life issues between the United States and Russia. The film was much more successful than The Final Frontier on all fronts. In 1993, Star Trek The Next Generation got a spin-off with Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Instead of following a ship as it journeyed to different planets, this series would focus on a space station near the first stable wormhole. The show has a large cult following, many calling it the best of all the Trek series. And while it was still a very successful show lasting seven years, it failed to have the same cultural impact as the original series and The Next Generation. The desire for more Star Trek feature films was strong, but most of the original cast was ready to retire. It was decided to end the Next Generation series and begin putting that cast in the movies. Star Trek Generations was released in 1994. The three cast members of the original series that wished to continue making movies made an appearance in this film. The film did fine at the box office but received very poor reviews. The next year came Star Trek Voyager. This time the premise was about a starship stranded 70 years away from the Federation at maximum war. The show lasted for 7 years like TNG and Deep Space Nine, but has less of a fan base. Plenty of people felt it was fine, but almost no one would say it was the best Star Trek series. The Next Generation cast got their second movie in 1996. The film does its own version of the Wrath of Khan, forcing the captain to come under fire from an old nemesis, only with a twist. Instead of a villain going on an insane bloodlust revenge, it's Picard. First Contact proved that the film series with The Next Generation could be viable and was the most successful Star Trek movie to date. In 1997, Star Wars saw the release of the 20th anniversary special editions to theaters. The trilogy was released with improved special effects and computer graphics. While the fans were excited to see the movie in theaters again, their response to the editions was mixed at best. It wasn't helped that George Lucas refused to release anything but these in digital form. For a limited time, DVDs with the original version versions of the movies were available, but those didn't have any type of remastering added to help the older picture. Those versions were also released with black bars and code on the top and bottom, further degrading the picture quality and making the picture extra small on HD TVs. In 1998, Star Trek Insurrection came out. Everyone was excited to see where the Star Trek movies would go after First Contact, and it ended up going in the direction of a two-hour episode, and not even a particularly good episode. While the movie did find at the box office, it was a clear decline from First 
contact. Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace came out in 1999 with huge fan anticipation. The film had what were at the time some of the best computer animation ever seen and even featured the first fully computer animated character. And the story of the prequels would be the origin of Darth Vader and the Empire. The film received the worst reviews of any Star Wars movie so far, but with anticipation as high as it was, it was still a huge success at the box office. In 2001, Star Trek Voyager ended and Star Trek decided to take the prequel route for Enterprise. The Star Trek brand seemed to be taking a hit with the reduced success of Insurrection and the ratings decline of Voyager. The choice was made to have this show distance itself from the Star Trek brand while still being in continuity. The show is about the first Starfleet warp capable ship before the Federation was created. Despite an interesting premise, much of the show was written like the worst Voyager episodes. The show was the first Star Trek series to be cancelled early since the original series. Though to the show's credit, the final season was decent despite a terrible final episode. Star Wars Episode 2 Attack of the Clones was released in 2002. This time, the movie was slightly better received than Episode 1 critically, and although it made quite a bit less money than the previous entry, it still far surpassed its budget. Towards the end of 2002, the final Next Generation movie was released. Star Trek Nemesis was a failure with critics and barely made its money back. It didn't help that they attempted to almost clone the Wrath of Khan script, right down to a major character dying, except unlike Wrath of Khan, everything felt substandard. With the reception of Nemesis, it was decided to end the Star Trek film franchise. With the death of Enterprise a couple years later, it appeared as though Star Trek was dead again. Star Wars Episode 3 was released in 2005. Set up to be the end of the prequel trilogy and the final Star Wars movie ever, the critical reception of this movie was a sizable upgrade from Attack of the Clones. The film did significantly better than Attack of the Clones at the box office as well. Both franchises appear to be out for a time being, but in 2008 a new Star Wars film was released. The animated movie Star Wars Clone Wars was released to the poorest critical reception in box office yet. The movie launched into a television series that ran from 2008 to 2014, and is the only Star Wars material considered canon that doesn't have an episode number attached at this point. A year later, a new Star Trek movie was released, this time sold as a prequel, with the original crew recast and only Leonard Nimoy returning. The movie turned out to be a reboot sequel with Spock from the original timeline being sent back in time and altering the past. This allowed the filmmakers to make new stories with the original crew without being required to follow any set timeline. The film was a critical and financial success. The fans were split on it. Some hated that Star Trek had become a big sci-fi action movie while others just enjoyed the movie for what it was and were happy to just get some Star Trek. George Lucas always held on to the Star Wars franchise with an iron fist, so it came as a shock to everyone that he sold the brand to Disney in late 2012. Disney declared that only the previous seven theatrical movies and the Clone Wars series would remain canon. Everything else was considered non-canon. They made plans to start building on this. In 2013, Star Trek Into Darkness was released, and it was again a critical and financial success. The fans were even more torn on this one for how it copied moments from Wrath of Khan and how McCoy apparently is able to cure death at the end. The movie is fast-paced enough, so it is possible to ignore the problems and have fun with the film, but in to Darkness does fall apart under any scrutiny. In late 2014, Star Wars Rebels came to TV and was the first part of the new Star Wars canon released. With a bunch of new movies in the planning stages, it appears as though Disney is trying to put together a Star Wars cinematic universe. Star Wars The Force Awakens hit theaters in December 2015 to critical and fan acclaim. Its box office was record-breaking, almost becoming the first movie to hit $1 billion in the United States alone. There was also a backlash to the film from a very vocal few who felt the film covered too much familiar ground, largely covering a story similar to the original film and borrowing elements from The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. In July 2016, Star Trek Beyond was released, celebrating the 50-year anniversary of the first airing of the TV series. Critics and fans loved the movie. However, general audiences showed a disinterest. Despite this, plans for a sequel went forward. In December of 2016, Disney made the first Star Wars spin-off movie with Rogue One, A Star Wars Story. It was mired in production troubles, but was released with critical praise in a huge box office. A noticeable step down from The Force Awakens, but that was to be expected. Star Trek returned to the small screen to be the premiere show for CBS's new streaming service. Star Trek Discovery had an initial reaction that was mixed leaning positive, but as it progressed became more negative. Debuting about the same time, another Star Trek show started, except it wasn't called Star Trek. Seth MacFarlane's The Orville 
shows a world very similar to that seen in Star Trek, at first borrowing too strongly from Star Trek, before progressing into its own thing, which still felt like Star Trek, but something new instead of a copy. In December, Star Wars The Last Jedi was released. The critics loved it, and the box office was again huge. However, the hatred of the movie was perhaps the most vitriolic of the entire franchise. It seemed as though fans either loved or hated this movie, with no in-between allowed. Talks of Star Trek IV continued, with Quentin Tarantino interested in picking up the reins and making his own version. Unfortunately, negotiations with Chris Pine and Chris Hemsworth who's supposed to reprise his role as George Kirk, fell apart, leaving the movie in production limbo. Solo, A Star Wars Story, was released in the summer of 2018, and the reviews were mostly positive. The movie was once again mired in production difficulties. The box office proved to be a huge letdown, sending most of Star Wars spin-off tales into limbo. Star Wars Episode IX is getting ready for a December 2019 release, while Star Trek experiences some new unexpected competition from Seth MacFarlane, who may be beating them at their own game. It's clear that both franchises have no plans of going away anytime soon. Something you may have noticed is that they never really come in direct competition with each other. Sure, you could say the same thing for Marvel and DC films, but they have always competed with each other in the comic books for ages. Star Wars and Star Trek always just coexisted. In fact, it's almost certain that Star Wars is the reason Star Trek was more than just a three season long sci-fi show from the 60s. Star Wars and Star Trek have never threatened each other's existence. In fact, quite the opposite. They have benefited from each other's existence. The biggest difference between the two is that Star Wars has always been primarily a film series, while Star Trek has mostly been a television series. Another thing I've always found with the two franchises is that Star Wars always felt more story-driven, while Star Trek felt character-driven. Even when there's a war in Star Trek, it's a war that is starred by characters with their own reasons and motivations. The best reason for the titular war in Star Wars is because Palpatine is evil. I have mixed feelings as to which I prefer. If I were to separate each story into its own group, my favorite would be the original Star Wars trilogy. But if it were either all of Star Wars or all of Star Trek, I would likely go with Star Trek if for no other reason than the raw number of quality entertainment hours it has. The competition between these two huge franchises is primarily a fan thing, and it sometimes becomes a cast thing, but it's mostly a fan thing. Both have high points and low points, and both are two of the best sci-fi franchises out there, and well worth the time of anyone interested in checking them out. Though I do advise if you watch Star Wars to watch them in order of release rather than by episode number. If you go by episode number, you'll be confused why people praise a series with Jar Jar Binks as a major character. Hey, if you like this video, please make sure to hit that like button and go ahead and subscribe. That helps me out a lot. And if you really love this video, consider visiting my Patreon page. 